So today is the day before the RX 6700 XT officially launches. And if you're lucky enough, you might be able to get one uh, tomorrow when they go on sale at 9 a.m. PSD. Once again, that's 9 a.m. Pacific time. Now, if you wanna know why these cards are so important for AMD, uh, you can check out this awesome overview that Dimitri did uh, right over here. But in order for this card to have any success at all, it needs three things. Great performance, a competitive price, and probably the most important one, availability. Look, it's obvious by now that even a massive amount of stock won't be enough since demand is just way higher than supply. But the Radeon team absolutely needs to prove that they can supply more than a trickle of GPUs like they did with the RX 6800 and the 6900 series. That was a complete disaster in my opinion. Even if every one of them sells out in the blink of an eye, getting regular resupplies out there is a huge part of winning the battle and it's something that they just haven't been able to do yet. At least in this video, we can answer 1080p, 1440p, and 4K performance, and pricing questions, of course, and throw in some overclocking results as well. Now, remember, there are timestamps in the timeline down below if you wanna jump to a particular section, or you can go to the description if you missed out on a particular chapter, uh, because there's a ton of testing in this one. So let's get started, but first, a quick message from our sponsor. Power your system with incredible power, the Dark Power 12 from Be Quiet. This one has the highest efficiency rating possible, 80 plus titanium certification, impressive frameless fan cooling, an overclocking key to switch between single and multi-rail operation, and fully modular cables. Check it out below. All right, so let's get right into a quick rundown of the things that you need to know about the RX 6700 XT. First of all, it gets 2560 stream processors, which is a pretty major cut compared to the RX 6800, and it's based on the Navi 22 core. Supposedly, Navi 22 is a lot easier to produce in larger quantities uh, than the RX 6800 series Navi 21, and that could lead to more inventory. Maybe, but... You just never know. There's also 12 gigabytes of GDDR6 operating at 16 gigabits per second on a 192-bit wide memory bus and 96 megabytes of infinity cache. But check out those clock speeds, guys. They're a lot higher than anything AMD's launched so far, which should make up for some of the ARC 6700 XT's stream processor loss. Now, in order to actually hit those frequencies, AMD needed to push the core to 1.2 volts, and that ends up leading to pretty high power consumption. Meanwhile, pricing for the 6700 XT places it $100 below the 6800 and a lot closer to the RTX 3070 and the RTX 3060 Ti. Now, a lot of that's because AMD figures their 12 gigabytes of memory will be appealing than eight gigabytes, especially for folks rocking high resolution monitors. But that might be a bit of a hard sell since in their own slides, it shows the $400 3060 Ti and 6700 XT trading blows rather than outright domination from AMD. Even in comparison to the RX 5700 XT's launch price, there's a hefty $80 or 20% premium. So it isn't a perfectly clear upgrade path either. Now let's talk a little bit about this reference card. And personally, I think it's one of the best looking GPUs around right now. Initially, it looked like you wouldn't be able to find this design at normal retailers, but uh, a lot of board partners will be selling this design uh, alongside their custom GPUs or custom cards. It's pretty compact too, it's just 10.4 inches long, and it takes up only two slots, so fitting it inside smaller systems won't be a problem. Even though it consumes almost the same amount of power as the 6800, it actually has a smaller internal heatsink and only uses two fans. Now, will that end up leading to higher temperatures or increased noise? Well, we'll see in a bit. As for power input, it's handled by an eight plus six pin layout, but one of the disappointing things is AMD actually eliminated the USB-C port on the rear IO panel, even though uh, there's three DisplayPort 1.4s and a single HDMI 2.1. Now, speaking of power, let's see how the ARC 6700 XT behaves from that perspective. One highlight of AMD's Navi architecture is its stable power delivery. Instead of a readout filled with peaks and valleys like the RTX 3070, the RX 6700 XT hardly ever hits above its 225 watt board power. Even when it does, it's only by one or two watts. Now bringing those results into a bit more readable charts shows the average power consumption actually being right in line with the RTX 3070 and only a few watts behind the reference RX 6800. Now AMD obviously made some massive strides in performance per watt, over the RX 5700 XT as well. I hardly ever talk about idle power anymore since modern cards are super efficient in that area, but it's still monitored in every test. And I think it's good that we did here as well. 
You see, there was something obviously going on with the RX 6700 XT. After we looked into it a bit further, I think we found another culprit too. You see, we were using a 4K 120 Hertz display and when doing power consumption testing and whenever it was set to that resolution and refresh rate, idle power just jumped. Meanwhile, lowering it to 60 Hertz fixed the issue. Either way, AMD is aware of this problem and they should be rolling out a driver fix for it really soon. Even with the chip chewing down about 220 watts with some peaks above 230 watts and a more simplified heatsink design, temperatures are still really, really well managed. Remember, the worst case hotspot temperature on these cards is set to 110 degrees and the reference design doesn't get anywhere close to that. With a game clock of 2,454 megahertz and a maximum boost clock of 2,581 megahertz under the best conditions, seeing a 2,530 megahertz average means the card's behaving in a really predictable way. Now, originally I thought that the smaller and more compact cooler with two instead of three fans would cause this thing to be a bit louder uh, than the reference 6800, but it actually ended up being quieter and there wasn't any inductor whine I kept hearing on higher end Radeon cards. All right, so now that the stage has been set, let's get on to seeing how this all translates into performance. Now, this is the test system that we're gonna be using this time, but you'll notice some of the results have been updated for older cards uh, since there's been a few game updates that modified frame rates in a few titles. Also, this is the first card that we're testing in all three resolutions. So that's 1080p, 1440p, and 4K. Let's start with 1080p. At 1080p, the RX 6700 XT really isn't anything special, but that's likely due to the fact that some games like CSGO and Valorant tend to be CPU limited, which artificially caps frame rates. But even then, this card trades blows with the RTX 3060 Ti rather than the RTX 3070. What you can expect is a good bump over the RX 5700 XT. Now that leads to it having a pretty poor overall value if you're gaming at 1080p, though it doesn't fare better than the RX 6800. Then again, all of this is only valid if you can actually find one for $480. Now let's see if it'll improve at 1440p. So this is supposed to be a 1440p champion, but the 6700 XT ended up showing performance that was all over the place. In some games, it dominated, while in others, it got whipped pretty bad, especially in the 1% lows. The lack of consistency resulted in it narrowly edging out the 3060 Ti on average, uh, while being pretty far behind in 99th percentile frame rates. The end result from a value perspective is a bit narrower, but this really does show how the RTX 3060 Ti is almost too good of a GPU. It's just so far out in front when it comes to delivering on the dollar per FPS front, even with eight gigabytes of memory. But will the RTX 3060 Ti's memory limitation finally come up in 4K? Well, let's check it out. Well, it turns out that increasing resolution can make the 6700 XT look a lot better, especially when it comes to the 1% lows, which are now better than the RTX 3060 Ti. But man, it's the lack of consistency that keeps coming up. I mean, sometimes the XT beats the RTX 3070 cleanly, and then in the next game, it gets owned by the 3060 Ti. Based on overall results, I wouldn't buy anything under a 6800 or 3070 for 4K gaming but the 6700 XT does deliver an okay value here. It just struggles to justify its overall cost at any resolution though. Ray tracing performance is, 
Well, like you'd expect, not all that great. This generation of AMD cards really isn't geared towards high levels of RT. So if you want to run with ray tracing on, then NVIDIA is just a much better option right now. Personally though, I think in most cases, turning the feature on really isn't worth it unless you use NVIDIA's DLSS to improve overall performance on games that support it. So now that we know the baseline performance, I guess it's time to head into some other areas, starting with smart access memory. Now, I need to remind everyone that SAM, is, which is a short term, is only officially available on 500 series motherboards paired with 3000 or 5000 series CPUs. So it's not like everyone would have access to it. Either way, in games we tested, there are some benefits at 1080p, but there are also situations where something's obviously not going right, and smart access memory ends up hurting rather than improving performance. I'm guessing AMD's only validated it with a handful of titles so far. So yeah, take that for what it is. 1440p shows even smaller benefits or even larger frame rate drop-offs. So if you are one of a few using a 500 series motherboard right now, I'd recommend testing your favorite games with this enabled and disabled just to see which would benefit you more. 4K proves smart access memory has a diminishing law of returns as resolutions and detail settings increase. Here, there are only either identical results or lower frame rates. When it comes to squeezing a bit more value out of any GPU, overclocking can sometimes lead to some pretty big benefits. So let's see what this little card can actually do, uh, starting off with limits AMD's putting on it. First of all, AMD's limiting the maximum clock to 2950 megahertz, so just shy of three gigahertz, but I'm sure there's gonna be a third-party software that allows for more than that. Uh, we were able to max this thing out on the reference card without any issues. The minimum frequency, on the other hand, is a lot more picky since it locks the GPU at a minimum speed rather than allowing AMD's boost algorithms to modulate uh, in real time. So we just ended up setting it to uh, 2600 megahertz since anything more than that and the card just hard locks. Like I mentioned earlier, voltage is set by default to about 1.2 volts. So in this section, it isn't really necessary until AMD unlocks higher values. I also need to mention that on our sample, increasing the power limit didn't really help with clock speeds in any way, which could point towards voltage being the major limiting factor. On the other hand, we were able to completely max out the memory to just over 17 gigabits per second. And what does this all lead in terms of clock speeds? Well, that's where things get really, really interesting. Clock speeds went from an average of 2,530 megahertz up to 2,834 megahertz, which is an increase of just over 10%. And this was done without a massive increase in temperatures or noise either. I mean, 10% isn't a lot, but finding a stable overclock took less than an hour using AMD's built-in tools. So it's definitely novice friendly. Typically a 10% clock speed increase will only lead to pretty limited returns, but it seems like the memory overclock is probably the reason behind some of the larger increases. I'd say the biggest benefit was that it firmed up those 1% lows really well and allowed a lot better competition within the NVIDIA cards. The nice thing is that this was all done within AMD's limits, and if board partners come out with cards or BIOSes that allow for even more headroom, the 6700 XT could become a little monster of a card. So I guess this all leads me to summing this all up, and I think I'm going to go back on a riff off of a famous quote. There's no bad GPUs, only bad prices, and that's where the 6700 XT lands. You see, this isn't a bad GPU by any stretch of the imagination, but AMD is making a big statement with their $480 price point. With a cost that high, we'd expect it to hit near RTX 3070 performance levels, but unfortunately it doesn't. Simply put, the XT's performance inconsistencies really hurt AMD here. Sometimes it's amazing, while at others, it just gets defeated by the RTX 3060 Ti by a big margin. Now, enabling smart access memory does narrow the gap a bit, but only by a few percentage points in the games we tested. And it's only available for a very narrow range of platforms. I think all of this highlights how the market's going right now. AMD does pretty well in their sponsored games, while Nvidia does better in theirs and then in others. It's just a toss up and that's exactly what our results show. But I guess at this point, um, if you're looking to buy one of these new GPUs, all I want to say is good luck if you find one, especially at that price point. And for everyone else, uh, spend responsibly.